Yam param dimahi. Oh my Lord Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O oh, all pervading personality of Godhead. Uh, for my respectful obeisance is unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primal cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations, of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma projita kaitravocha paramo nirmatsaranam satam vedyam vastavam atravastu shivinam tapa trayon mulinam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite. Kim Vaprayar Ishwaraha. Sadyo Hriti Avarudyate Tra. Kriti Bihi Sususubis Dakshanan. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpataror galitam falam sukumukad amrita dravyasam yutam pibata Bhagavatam rasam alayam Mahur Ahorasika Bhuvi Bhavakaha. O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Shi Sukadev Goswami. Therefore this fruit has become even more tasteful even though its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hridiyam Taksto Hi Abhadrani Vidunoti Suhitsatam to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, 
Lord Krishna, who is dwelling in everyone's heart. Acts as a best wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta presu madresu Mityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tomo bhava, chete et akama to badayas chaye, chete et hair anavidam, stitvam satve prasiddhati. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso Bhagavat bhakti yogataha Bhagavat tattva vijnanam Mukta sangha shijayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in its position of pure goodness becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hirdaya grantis chityante sarvasamsaya shiyante chasya karmani drista evatmanishwari Thus bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, Verse number 32 and 33. Pramada yo bahutitam yada panga moksha Kamasta pasamacharan bhagavat prapana Sashi swabasam aravindavanam vihaya Yet part of Subhagam Alam Bajate Nu Anurakta Tasyaham Abja Kulisanku Sake to Ketai Shimat Pade Bhagavata Samalangi Kirtangi Trin Atya Rocha Upalabya Tato Vibhutim Lokan Samam Vyastrijad Uts Mayatim Tan Ante Translation Lakshmiji, the goddess of fortune, whose glance of grace was sought by demigods like Brahma and for whom they surrendered many a day unto the personality of Godhead, gave her own abode in the forest, gave up her own abode in the forest of lotus flowers, and engaged herself in the service of the lotus tree to the Lord. I was endowed with specific powers to supersede the fortune of all the three planetary systems by being decorated with the impressions of the flag, thunderbolt, elephant driving, rod and lotus flower, which are signs of the lotus feet of the Lord. But at the end, when I felt I was so fortunate, 
the Lord left me. Shila Prabhupada ki jai, purport by His Divine Grace. This is Parikshit Maharaj speaking. The beauty and opulence of the world can be enhanced by the grace of the Lord and not by any man-made planning. When the, Lord, when the Lord Sri Krishna was present on this earth, the impressions of the special signs of his lotus feet were stamped on the dust, and as a result of this specific grace, the whole earth was made as perfect as possible. In other words, the rivers, the seas, the forests, the hills, and the mines, which are the supplying agents for the necessities of men and animals, were fully discharging their respective duties. Therefore, the riches of the wor world surpassed all the riches of all other planets in the three planetary systems of the universe. One should, therefore, ask that the grace of the Lord always be present on earth so that we may be favored with his causeless mercy and be happy, having all necessities of life. One may ask how we can detain the Supreme Lord on this earth after his mission is fulfilled and he has left this earth for his own abode. The answer is that there is no need to detain the Lord. The Lord being omnipresent can be present with us if we want him at all. By his omnipresence, he can always be with us if we are attached to his devotional service by hearing, chanting, remembering, etc. There is nothing in the world with which the Lord is disconnected. The only thing we must learn is to excavate the source of connection and thus be linked with him by offenseless service. We can be connected with him by the transcendental sound representation of the Lord. The holy name of the Lord and the Lord himself are identical. And one who chants the holy name of the Lord in an, offen in an offenseless manner can at once realize that the Lord is present before him. Even by the vibration of the radio sound, we can partially realize sound relativity. And by resounding the sound of transcendence, we can verily feel the presence of the Lord. In this age, when everything is polluted by the contamination of Kali, it is instructed in the scriptures and preached by Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that by chanting the holy name of the Lord, we can at once be free from contamination and gradually rise to the status of transcendence and go back to Godhead. The offenseless chanter of the holy name of the Lord is as auspicious as the Lord himself. And the movement of the pure devotee of the Lord all over the world can at once change the troublesome face of the world. Only by the propagation of the chanting of the holy name of the Lord can we immune, can we be immune from all effects of the age of Kali. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So in the Vedic literatures it says, Namachintamani Krishnas Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha. Purnak Sudo Nitya Mukto Binatman Namanamino. And it says that uh, the holy name uh, of Krishna is transcendentally blissful if it bestows all spiritual benedictions, for it is Krishna himself the reservoir of all transcendental pleasure. So, being able to chant the holy name of the Lord is the greatest benediction one can receive. And therefore, Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. That's if you want to be happy. This chanting Hare Krishna will make you immediately happy. And it's the first effect of chanting, that is, that chetadarpanam arjanam, it cleanses the heart of unclean desires and thoughts that are, have been acquired over many, many lifetimes in different bodies in the material world. 
And thus, we're no longer addicted to bad habits. Uh, obsessive eating, oversleeping, overmating, and overdefending. These are tendencies that have corrupted our heart and mind. So the heart is the seat of emotions and yearnings. So sensual pleasures are experienced in the subtle mind which receives all the impressions of the other five senses. So uh, when we have a contaminated mind, we're beleaguered, we're possessed in a sense by material desires and those material desires are compared to dirt or dust that uh, dirties the mirror of the mind the mind becomes corrupted with many images of uh, corrupt things and we cannot comprehend it, that state of, of mental disturbance transcendental knowledge or spiritual wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita that's just the problem. So all the layers of dust and the coverings of the material of the mirror of the mind are actually in the form of lusty desires for sense gratification. Okay, so this first thing that we feel or we experience is the clearing of the mind of a lot of this uh, contamination or lusty desires. And the Vedic Varnashram system that we spoke about yesterday uh, prescribes many purifying processes or performances that are meant for gradual elevation or gradual purification of the mind and the heart. But the initial effect of chanting, Hare Krishna progressively accomplishes the same thing very quickly and easily if it's performed in the, in the company of sincere and rightfully situated devotees. So therefore it says, Krishna Bhakti Niskama Ateva Santa Bhukti Mukti Siddhikami Sakali Asanta Because the, the devotee of Lord Krishna is materially desireless, he's peaceful. However, fruit of activities desire uh, material enjoyment and the jnanis desire material liberation and the yogis desire material opulence. Therefore, they are all lusty and cannot be peaceful. And this is Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya 1949. So, the unique desire of the devotee is to be always engaged in the service of Krishna. And that's the meaning of the Hare Krishna mantra. And this is not just in this life, but life after life, eternally. And the devotee does not ask for liberation or anything else. He simply asks, or she simply asks for service. So the materialists, the fruit of workers, they're asking, like the karmis, uh, they're asking for all kinds of material desires and sensual pleasures. That's the uh, karma, karma, uh, karma uh, self-interested karma yo uh, yogis. And then the self-interested jnana yogis, they are looking for Vedic knowledge and renunciation so that they can merge into the Brahman effulgence. And the uh, mystic yogis, they want... Uh, powers, and they do great austerities to acquire the yoga cities. So, all of these people want something, but the devotee doesn't want anything material. He simply wants to be able to use everything material and everything spiritual in the service of Krishna. So, when you use something material in the service of Krishna, it reveals its spiritual nature. Everything is, even everything in the material world is actually spiritual. But when we look at it with the eyes of l l using it to please our lusty desires, it 
looks material. But when we look at the same thing with the desire to engage in the Krishna service, it, be, it reveals its spiritual, the real spiritual nature. So uh, our, the way we look to, uh, will determine what we see. And it's very interesting in, in modern quantum mechanics, they also factor in the way a person looks at something. So the definition or the, the way that philosophy is, uh, let's say, named in Sanskrit is darshan, which means how you see things. So that's a real uh, definition of philosophy. It's not that it's the love of wisdom as the Greek words that describe it in English, philosoph. But no, it's how you see things. So if we see things with the eyes of sense gratification, we only see matter. We don't see the spirit. But if we see things with the eyes that everything belongs to Krishna and real knowledge is knowing how to use everything in Krishna's service, we see the spiritual aspect of everything because Krishna is present as Paramatma. So all the non-devotees are self-interested because they desire something for themselves, whether they're karma yogis, jnana yogis, or astanga yogis. But the bhakti yogi, if they're in good association always, do not desire anything for their own selfish purpose. They only desire to please Krishna. Okay, so the psychological basis for the devotee's uninterrupted peace and happiness is the guarantee Krishna gives that he'll always remain the friend and benefactor of the devotee. Kontiya pratijanihi nami bhakta pranasiti. If the devotee has faith in this statement by Krishna, then he's always in a peaceful state of mind. So Prabhupada uh, explains this. He says, since Krishna gives his assurance, the devotee lives in Krishna and has no desire for personal benefit. The background for the devotee is the all good himself, Krishna. Why should the devotee aspire for something good for himself? His only business is to please the Supreme by rendering as much service as possible. A Krishna Bhakta has no desire for his own personal benefit. He is completely protected by the Supreme. Avaisya Rakshibe Krishna Bhakta, Krishna Viswasa Palana. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that he is desireless because Krishna will give him protection in all circumstances. It is not that he expects any assistance from Krishna. He simply depends on Krishna just as a child depends on his parents. The child does not know how to expect service from his parents, but he's always protected nevertheless. This is called niskama, desirelessness. So that's Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya 19.49 in the purport. So this is the first effect or first result of chanting Hare Krishna. And then the second is Baba Mahadevagni Nirvapanam, stopping the blazing fire of material existence. And what is that? That's lust for sense gratification. That is the all-devouring enemy of the soul. And it evolves by contact with the material modes of passion. And if frustrated, it becomes destructive anger in the mode of ignorance and, and greed. So the pure consciousness of the living entity is covered by his eternal enemy, lust. Kama esa, krota esa, raga guna samud bhavan. So that's mahasana, mahapapma, vidi enam, ihavairinam. So this vairinam, this, this vicious enemy is lust for sense gratification. So uh, it burns like fire and it cannot be satisfied by any amount of uh, sense enjoyment. So some people think, uh, just like the phony uh, 
Bhagavan Rajna's niche. His philosophy was, you don't have to give up anything. Just engage intensely in sense gratification. Eventually you'll get tired of it. Right. That was his philosophy. And that's, what, and that's why so many people went to him. And mostly dumb Americans and, and Europeans. Because uh, that's what they want to hear. Intensely engage in sense gratification. You see? So he... He was a clever man. He was a psychologist. He knew what he was doing, saying, even though he's a demon, but he knew how to catch people. And he became a very prominent, so-called prominent guru, many, many disciples coming from all over the world to Pune to get his blessings. So what happened? When he opened a big ashram in Oregon, the United States, uh, Thousands of people came to him, right? And right away, they had an outbreak of AIDS <laughs> in their ashram. It freaked out the uh, so-called Bhagavan. And then, uh, then they tried to take over the government of the local township and freaked out the Americans, the citizens. And then... The way they did that was to collect all the bums and homeless people in the United States and different towns and bring them, because they're all American citizens, to vote them in. And it actually worked. Right. And, but then <laughs> the, the, uh, those, those people brought uh, the AIDS with them. And they were having uh, you know, free sense gratification. So, you see, the whole thing became a hoax. And ultimately, uh, his best disciples, which were all women, because women dominate, whenever there's uh, free sex, women dominate the society. Uh, so, what happened is, these powerful women that were his closest, let's say, uh, you know, disciples, they took all the money that was hidden in Switzerland and left. And they were Indians. <laughs> They're not dumb. Indians are not dumb. You know, they, they go for the money, right? <laughs> so, of course, Rajneesh was an Indian also. So then, what did he do? He was, uh, he was also uh, uh, under indictment by the FBI and the IRS it was, it was that FBI and IRS for uh, tax evasion. He had at one time 99 Rolls Royces in this little town of uh, Oregon. It's a very small town. And he was just flouting his opulence. So the FBI, I mean, the IRS got on, on his case. And what did he do? He ran away, went back to India to get away from uh, being prosecuted. And his whole ashram in o Oregon collapsed. And then he said, he, he had a change of, of uh, orientation. He became Osho. Osho is a Japanese name. And he became a Buddhist. Now, why did he do that? This is very interesting. Prabhupada explains this. When you try to become the supreme sense enjoyer in the material world, you try and acquire everything. So, you know, he had 99 Rolls Royces, he had this, he had that, he had ashrams all over the place, in Switzerland and everywhere. And when you get frustrated and defeated, you become a Mayavadi, you become a Buddhist. So when you want to be the uh, uh, alpha male, you want to possess everything. When that fails, then you want to give everything up. Right? You see? He goes from one extreme to the other. So he called himself Osho, and he became like a Buddhist, you know, not attached to anything and so forth. And that, of course, was phony, and uh, eventually he died. 
So this whole thing was a failure, but still, to show you how dumb people are, still he has followers. And if you read any of his books, which I hope you don't do, you can find them, you can find them in the, uh, in the secondhand bookstores, right? <laughs> You'll see that everything he says is completely the opposite of what's said by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. This was his special specialty. He was what you call an iconoclast. That means he breaks all rules. So if Krishna says, don't have illicit uh, affairs, he recommended it. And his philosophy was, the more you have, the closer you'll become to becoming a sannyasi, because eventually you'll get tired of it. But what happened? Nobody got tired of it. <laughs> because the more gasoline you put on the fire, the more it burns, right? So, but it takes time to figure out all these things. Just like it took... Uh, at least 80, 90 years to figure out that communism doesn't work. It looks, it sounds wonderful. It sounds almost like Krishna consciousness because Krishna consciousness is spiritual communism. So it sounds, you know, everybody, you know, works together and there are no class distinctions. There's only one class. We're all workers, which was nonsense. It didn't work because uh, they tried to make a classless society, but after some time, the four classes came back. But by the time it was collapsing, you had what's called the nomenklatura in, in Russian, which was the uh, ruling class, the, the, the uh, chatriyas. And then you had the uh, vaishas, who were directors of the publicly owned businesses, but they were managers, right? They were vaishas. And then you had the sudras, which was the biggest class, and, and they were like the farm workers and the factory workers and the musicians and actors, and they're also sudras. And then you had the intellectuals, who were like, you know, the so-called priests. So you had the four classes, even though they claimed that they were going to have a classless society. Say. So, you can't change anything Krishna has created. So, uh, he created these four uh, orders or four divisions of society. So, they tried to destroy it, they couldn't do it. And Rajneesh, he tried to go against everything Krishna says, it didn't work. It was, a, it was a complete failure. So we see how the devotee takes refuge in this, in this promise of Krishna, kontiya pratijanihi nami bhakta pranasyati. Okay, so I want to stop right there. I want to, I want to continue this tomorrow. I've written this book, and all this is explained in this book. Really interesting. Uh, are there any questions? Why do people play around with these things? Let's try that. No, they play around with it. There it goes. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Thank you. So, it's um, this process of uh, chanting holy names. Uh, like we sing in the Sikha Sakam, the great benediction for humanity. Why is it so difficult for people, you know, to understand 
that Krishna is no different from his name. And they don't really, you know, they don't get it. And, and people, some people, they get bored of it. It was some, some or other, they, they just give it up, you know. Or they, they struggle, they love, great struggle, really, you know. Well, well the, there's nothing. Yeah. The, uh, when Narada Muni approached Valmiki, who at that time was a hunter, and he told him, you know, you, you give up this uh, killing animals and uh, chant the name of God. And he, he tried to give him the name Rama. And Valmiki tried to chant it. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't pronounce it, right? And Dr. <laughs> Mooney was shocked. And basically, because he had eaten so much meat and killed so many animals, he wasn't mm. able to say the name of God. So then, Narada Muni, of course, the greatest saint in the universe, he, he said, okay, well, you like to kill, don't you? He said, yes. Okay, so your mantra is Mara. So he started chanting Mara, 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 He started with Mara and ended up with Rama and became purified. So why is it, well, you're asking basically two questions. Why is it that people have difficulty chanting? And why is it that even if they chant, sometimes they give it up? Yeah, they don't understand that it's no different from Krishna. Yeah. Because, what did Prabhupada say? Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. You have to be hearing this Bhagavat daily, every day, morning and evening. Because, as we said before, a disease is forgetfulness. And as soon as, you know, an idle mind is the devil's workshop, as soon as we go on a slippery slope and say, well, I missed all my rounds. That's okay. I don't have to make them up. You know, nobody knows. <laughs> and, uh, and then also other things, you know, people do on the slippery slope. So eventually they're committing offenses and that affects them. That affects their determination to chant and once you start doing that, you don't want to hear the classes either because every time in the class we were saying, you know, no meat eating, no gambling, no intoxication, no illicit sex, right? And it's like, you know, painful for them to hear those things because <laughs> secretly they're doing some of those things, right? So it, that pain is in the form of, you know, uh, I don't want to hear this anymore. It's the same thing all the time. Don't do this. Don't do that. I don't want to hear don't do this. I want to hear do it. Well, <laughs> then he goes to Rajneesh. You know, Rajneesh is saying, do it. <laughs> you see. So it's, it's the lack of that regular hearing and reminding us that, you know, this is a great, great journey here. We're going from the material world back to the spiritual world. But you know, it's not a geographical movement from one place to another. The spiritual world is right here. But as long as we're seeing with the eye of sense gratification, we don't see the spiritual aspect. As soon as we purify that way of seeing, then all of a sudden the spiritual aspect of, the, of what looks like the material world reveals itself. It's so it's this, this liberation is not geographical. You're not moving from one place to another or going from down here to up there or something like that. Krishna is right here. You don't have to find, find him somewhere else. We just have to purify our mind and our senses um, from sense gratification and direct it toward pleasing the senses of Krishna. We're not denying the senses, but we're saying these great instruments have a specific use. It's to glorify the Lord. So that's my understanding. Yeah, this is interesting. The last, the last sentence of the purport. The offensively chanted with the holy name of the Lord is as auspicious as the Lord himself. Yes. 
and the movement, the movement of pure devotees of the Lord all over the world can at once change the troublesome face of the world. Yes. Only by the propagation of the chanting of the holy name of the Lord can we be uh, immune from the, all the effects of the Kali Yuga. That is important. Yes. Well, make some comment there. Well, that's the that's the verse. Nama Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha. Punak Sudo Nitya Mukta Nitya Mukta Binat Vam Namanamino. Namino. So this Binat Vam Namanamino means that this the Lord Krishna's name is the reservoir of all pleasure. And therefore if you chant sincerely, you begin to feel that relief and that that transcendental ecstasy that comes. And that's called Anandamaya Vyasa, right? Mm -hmm. That's the nature of the soul. That's the real nature of the soul. The nature of the soul is not to be oppressed all the time by the modes of material nature and, and all kinds of crazy desires that are unreachable anyway. The, the nature of the soul is to be unfeathered, free, have complete freedom from lust, anger, greed, all these negative things. And then you, your freedom is the more you meditate on the beautiful form and pastimes of Krishna and his devotees, the more that beauty comes out, the more that ecstasy is felt. So in order to um, be situated at that platform, the key point is the offenseless chanting. Yes. So yes. it's not easy. <laughs> well, we have to. Uh, okay, it's this is the verse that I always go to to try and understand a little bit what it means. Advaita sarva bhutanam maitra karana evacha nirmamo nirhankara samadukha sukam shami santusta satatam yogi. Uh, it says, one who is not envious, that's the point, envious, but is a kind friend to all living entities, even their enemies, who does not think himself a proprietor and is free from false ego, who means attachment to the body, who is equal in both happiness and distress, who is tolerant, always satisfied, self-controlled, and engaged in devotional service with determination, his mind and intelligence fixed on me, meaning Krishna. Such a devotee of mine is very dear to me. So this is, this is like statement of, uh, let's say, a person who is really satisfied with being Krishna conscious. He doesn't have any of these bad qualities. And actually, this person says, it says in the purport, nor does a devotee become his enemy's enemy. He thinks, this person is acting as my enemy due to my own past misdeeds. So it is better to suffer than to protest. So and that's stated in Srimad Bhagavatam. 1014 Whenever a devotee is in distress or has fallen into difficulty, he thinks that it is the Lord's mercy upon him. He thinks, thanks to my past misdeeds, I should suffer far, far greater than I am suffering now. So it is by the mercy of the Supreme Lord that I am not getting all the punishment I am due. I am just getting a little by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, he's always calm, quiet, and patient, despite many distressful conditions. So this purport is amazing. And, and if you want to be always connected to Krishna, you have to take into account this purport and this verse. Otherwise, we're going to get easily sidetracked by envy, anger, jealousy, all these things. And we'll always be fighting. We'll, there'll always be an enemy. You know, one one goes away, another one comes into focus. So it's up to us to 
not see like that, not see in terms of friends and enemies. See, politics is all about friends and enemies, good guys and bad guys. Republican bad, Democrat good. Republican good, Democrat bad. So that's what the politics are, you know. Uh, the uh, 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 Modi good and Congress bad. Congress good, Modi bad. So we have to stay away from <laughs> that kind of uh, uh, you know, duality of uh, this one's good, that one's bad. Everything is bad mm -hmm. in the material world, right? Because it's taking our mind away from Krishna. Haripo. But Maharaj said in the beginning, I, I didn't understand, this verse is spoken by Parikiv Maharaj or Bhumi. This verse here? Uh, maybe I made a mistake. I'm not trying to understand. Yeah. I thought it was. Is a Bumi speaking? Oh, maybe. Maybe. What? Yeah. It's still Bumi speaking to yeah. personality of yeah, religion. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yes, yeah, sorry. It's okay. Okay, thank you. Yes. At his 12th chapter, verse 13 and 14. The one you said to read the Pope, the Pope, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, 10, the 12th? 12th chapter, verse 13 and 14. Okay. Yeah. I try and read it every day. <laughs> yeah. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, uh, one line from this purport, um, the only thing we must learn to execute the source of connection and thus be linked with him by the offenseless service. Yes. So, uh, Maharaj, if you can explain more on the offenseless service, uh, so that well, we, are, we are aware you know, of it. You have ten offenses against the holy name, you have ten offenses against the holy dham, ten offenses... Uh, I mean, there are different types of offenses. You know, so you have to avoid all those different offenses. If you look into the nectar of devotion, you'll see that. But if you just follow, you know, ten offenses against the holy name, then that, that covers most of them. You know. Is that what you, I mean, did you, let's see. Basically, my focus was on the offenseless service, like while while we are doing any service, which kind of uh, offenses we, sh we should be aware and not do. And doing one it. who chants the holy name of the Lord in an offenseless manner can at once realize that the Lord is present before him. Is that what you're talking about? It's in the second paragraph, in the beginning of second paragraph. Well, the only line. thing we must learn is to excavate the source of connection. Yes. You know what that means? No. Excavate means, you know, you, you dig in the ground to find a treasure, right? Or you find a, uh, an ancient city, or you, you know, so you excavate, you dig. So he's saying you have to excavate the source of connection. Well, the source of connection, uh, and thus be linked with him by offenseless service. So the source of connection is offenseless service. So offenseless service means you have to be on time, you have to be clean, your mind has to be focused on pleasing Krishna, and so forth. Okay. Right. So if your mind is wandering, and uh, you, I remember telling the story about the Pujari who always avoided washing the feet of Krishna when he was bathing Krishna. And then uh, he got a terrible infection on his le foot and he almost died. And when I went to see him in the hospital, I said, yeah, how did this happen? And he seemed a little sad. He said, I have to admit something. He said, uh, every day when I was bathing the deities, for some reason, I didn't bathe his feet. When, when you bathe the deities by meditation, right? It's not always physically. Sometimes it's physical, so you actually bathe the deity, but usually it's by meditation. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was always skipping that, and I think that's why this happened to me. <laughs> so that would that would be an offense, okay. right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Adipo, all go as appropriate. Yes. Oh, I wish you.
you all success, Prabhu. Because your success is the temple's success also. <laughs> <laughs>